What an exciting time that will be. Praise God. So we are going to be starting on a series called The Feasts of the Lord. Is anybody familiar with the, uh, the feasts already? You know a lot about the Jewish feasts, what they are, what they, are, what they represent, why they're important? Probably not. It's not something we spend a lot of time uh, really thinking about. Um, but hopefully at the conclusion of this study, you're going to be blown away by just the sovereignty of God, the power of God, the way that God is able to weave himself into our lives, into mankind, to coordinate his plans and his desires and somehow balance all of that out with man's free will. It's going to blow your mind. Uh, and so this is a really an exciting study. Um, the purpose for tonight is we're really just going to kind of lay the groundwork. Um, it, as I said, this is not something that most of us are very familiar with at all. Um, and so we're going to start from the very beginning, just kind of do a, an introduction to what the feasts are, a uh, little bit of background behind them, uh, just lay a bit of a foundation, and then we're going to spend the next several weeks going into each of these feasts individually in, in great detail. Um, and what's amazing to me is we did this series years ago, um, and, and it blew me away then, and as I've been studying again and preparing for this, it's blowing me away again. And, and what's amazing is the deeper you dig into this, the more you find. It's like you can, you can never exhaust the depth of just uh, of the power and sovereignty of God that's weaved into especially these feasts. Um, and so hopefully you're excited about this. I know I am. And, uh, and once we get started with this, I think you'll see uh, why it is such an exciting study. So give me a second here to get my screen share going. All right, so the feasts of the Lord. So the question then becomes, why study the feasts? And so I've kind of already... Uh, given a little bit of an answer to that, but some basic truths about the feasts of the Lord. Uh, first, the feasts were commemorated. They were initially started as a way to remind the people of what God had done for them. And so what you'll see is that these feasts have a basis in history. So these aren't just, you know, random uh, things that God made up for these people to do just to, you know, keep them busy. But these all have a very definite tie-in to the, his, the history of God's people. Um, you'll see that in the Passover, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Pentecost. And we know Pentecost, right? We're familiar with that term, at least. Um, the Feast of Trumpets. So as we go through all these different feasts, what you're going to see is they're not just, again, something that God made up to keep people busy, but these have a definite tie-in to history and, and point to an event where God intervened in the lives of his people. And so it's meant to remind them of that, uh, the, the help that God provided them in the past. That's meant to inspire faith so that, you know what, if God helped me then, then God can help me again in my situation now. Uh, it, it's, it's going to encourage you just in the sovereignty of God because you'll see just how, how powerfully God is able to move and to bring to pass his will. The feasts are a shadow of things to come. So not only do these have a tie-in with history and, and are meant to remind people of past events and pa God's involvement in, in the lives of his people, but also these are a shadow of things to come. That means that what you'll find is in each of these feasts, there are very specific representations of future events. So these aren't just, again, things that look back, but these are also things that look forward to something that God is going to do in the future. And then you'll also see that these provide spiritual insight into our relationship with God. So these not only help us to see what God has done, see what God is going to do, but they help us and give us insight just into our, our basic relationship with God itself and how we are to interact with Him. So there's, there's really a lot involved with these feasts, and so I want to just start by giving out a couple verses here, and you'll, the verses will be on the screen with the slideshow, but we're going to have someone read these. So John 1, whoever's got that. The next day John sees Jesus coming in him and says, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And how many are familiar with this scripture? Of course, we've heard this one, we know this one, but did you know that this scripture is specifically referring to a feast? It is specifically referring to one of the seven feasts that we're going to be studying. And if you understand the feast that he's referring to, this scripture has a much deeper level of insight and understanding. I mean, you just hear him say, the Lamb of God. Well, what, what does that mean? 
That makes no sense unless you understand the feast that he's referring to, the feast of Passover, which we'll look at in great detail. Luke 23, 44 through 46. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. So you notice there the reference to time until the ninth hour. Now, that just seems like a trivial detail. But if you know the details of the Passover and the Passover lamb, and when the Passover lamb was supposed to be sacrificed, that little phrase right there takes on a whole new meaning. Because the ninth hour was exactly when the Passover lamb was supposed to be crucified and slain for the sins of God's people, for the sins of mankind, and that is the very hour that Jesus died on the cross, the ninth hour at the exact time. So it gives it a whole new meaning when you understand the feast that it's referring to. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. First fruits, that's a word we use all the time, isn't it? Makes perfect sense. Well, if you understand the feast of first fruits, then that does make sense. You understand that what Paul is referring to here is that Jesus Christ fulfilled the feast of first fruits when he rose from the dead. That he is the literal fulfillment of that feast and all that it represents and all that it means. So it just brings new insight and new meaning. And what you're going to find is this is the case all through the New Testament. Is that all of these scriptures, so many of them refer back to the feasts. And once you have a deeper understanding of the feasts themselves, it's going to blow you away how much of the New Testament refers back to these feasts. One more. John 19, 36. For these things were done that the, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. Again, seems like a, a trivial detail that they didn't break any of his bones. Well, normally they do that when they're crucifying someone and they want to speed it up. They break their bones so that they suffocate and die faster. But that didn't happen to Jesus. Even though they were trying to speed it along, he had already died. So they didn't break any of his bones. And the reason that is significant is because that was the commandment of God for the Passover lamb. None of the bones were to be broken. And so you see Jesus fulfills that detail. And so there, there are... Tons of details just like this that, uh, that you're going to see that Jesus was the exact fulfillment of all of these feasts. And so it's, it's really just fascinating as we start getting into more of the details of this. So this is just to kind of whet your appetite a little bit to what we're going to. But I wanted to bring up an important reason why studying these feasts is so important. And I've kind of alluded to it in bringing up these scriptures. Um, but the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation... Uh, of John really give us some insight into this. So go ahead and read John 21 verse 25 and then is 2031 the same person? No, two different people. Okay, go ahead and read those I guess in order. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. And then 31. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So John is stating his purpose for what he has written. He says in 21, 25, he says, you know what, if I wrote everything, no book on earth could contain it all. That, you know, Jesus did so much that there, there is no book that could contain everything that he did. And so he was very specific in what he chose to write. And his motivation, he tells us in 2031, was these are written that you might believe Jesus is the Christ. So he is writing for a specific purpose, what he chose to include in his gospel, as well as 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Revelation. All these things were included because he is trying to demonstrate and inspire faith that Jesus is the Son of God. And what you see, especially as you go through the gospel of John, is that a lot of the fulfillment that you read about in the feasts is included in the Gospel of John. So John puts a lot of emphasis on the fulfillment of the feasts. And if you know the feasts, if you understand what he's talking about and what he's referring to, then you catch that. You see that. And so uh, that just kind of gives you some understanding of how important the feast is. It, it really brings you to the place where you can have the full revelation of who Jesus Christ is. And, and all of this together is, again, meant to inspire faith, confidence in God, the sovereignty of God. Bill? 
So one of the things I was thinking about, we just finished up that study on the rapture. And, you know, going through that, the rapture really was totally spelled out in Scripture. I mean, there, there's so many signposts throughout Scripture uh, that it really shouldn't take anyone by surprise. Well, by the, the same thing, these feasts, so many events occurred during on the same day as these feasts and will occur uh, during these feasts. And so, again, these things that are coming up in Bible prophecy, if you're a student of the Bible, they shouldn't take you by surprise. Things like the rapture and the things that we'll be studying in these feasts. God has them laid out perfectly in his word, uh, that if we'll study his word, then we'll never be taken by surprise by these things. Amen. So the Gospel of John records the fulfillment of the spring feasts, and then if you read through the book of Revelation, what it talks about is the future fulfillment of the fall feasts. And that may not make a lot of sense to you if you don't really know much about the feast, the spring feast, fall feast. What is that? I don't know what you're talking about. You will by the time we get through these studies. Um, but just pointing out that John does put special emphasis on the fulfillment of these feasts because that demonstrates that Jesus is the fulfillment. Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah that the Jewish people were trained to look for. They just, many of them missed him. Although you think about it, all the first Christians were Jews, so they didn't all miss him, but a lot of them did. Even though they had been rehearsing these things for thousands of years, they missed it when the time came. So Leviticus 23 is going to be our main text. Um, this is where uh, God ordains and appoints these seven feasts. Uh, the Feast of Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, the Feast of Weeks, which is also known as the Feast of Pentecost. And then you have the Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Booths. And so these are the seven feasts that we're going to talk about. Um, so let's go ahead and read uh, Leviticus 23, 1 and 2, where God begins to lay this out to his people. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. So here, if you read through the rest of Leviticus 23, which we won't do for time's sake, um, eventually we'll cover all that because he gives all the details about all of these feasts. But what he begins to lay out here is he's saying, You know what, Moses? I am ordaining some feasts for my people. These are my feasts, and I am ordaining these for you to follow. But what's interesting is if you begin to look at the word. Now, when we say the word feast, what do you think of? First, we think of food. food. Yeah, we think of eating. We think of uh, barbecue and whatever. You know, a, a big feast, lots of food. But that's really not what the Hebrew word actually means. And so there's a couple words in here that we need to look at to get a little bit better insight into what God is actually saying here. So the word feasts, and then also the word convocations. Again, that's another word we use all the time. I've used that several times this week, <laughs> studying this. So these two words, let's consider the Hebrew. So the word feast is actually the Hebrew word moed, and when you look up the literal meaning of that, it says it's an appointed time, place, or meeting. Basically, what this is referring to is an appointment, a scheduled Appointment. So the word feast, when we're reading it here in Leviticus 23, it's not talking about a big gathering to eat food. What it's talking about is a scheduled appointment. And then the word convocations is the Hebrew word mikra, which means a called out public meeting or a rehearsal. Basically, it's conveying the idea of a dress rehearsal. A dress rehearsal. So let's put that meaning back into this scripture. So Leviticus 23, 1 and 2, when we put that literal meaning into the scripture, what it says in verse 2 is, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them concerning the scheduled appointments of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy dress rehearsals, even these are my scheduled appointments. Now that puts a little bit different twist on it, doesn't it? That gives a little bit more insight into what these feasts are actually all about. These aren't just, you know, hey, let's get together and eat a bunch of food. But these are divine appointments set by God himself in heaven saying, you know what, I, I've got some appointments in my day calendar that I want to make you aware of. And so he he's, he's establishes these feasts, he set up these divine appointments, and what he calls them is convocations or dress rehearsals. So these are dress rehearsals. You know, when we did the children's church play, we did a, a full dress rehearsal before we did the actual thing. You know, we wanted to make sure everybody knew where to go, what to do, what to say, when to go, when to talk right into the microphone, when to back. You know, we, we wanted to make sure everybody knew what to do. 
And so that's exactly what's happening here is God is saying, I've got some appointments and I want everyone to understand what these appointments are all about. These are dress rehearsals to prepare you to recognize and be ready for the real thing. Does that make sense? That gives a little bit different twist on what these feasts are all about. And you know, it's interesting, all the way back in the beginning, someone read Genesis 1, 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Okay, so here we have kind of the same thing. Now, we understand for days and years, right, when we're talking about the sun, the moon, stars, we understand the seasons and tracking all that. But these words here, these two words, signs and the word seasons, again, let's look at the meaning here. So the word signs literally means signals, arranged, the definition of the word signals is arranged means of conveying information or instructions, particularly by prearrangement between parties. And then the word seasons is this same word, moed, which means scheduled appointments. So again, let's look at that scripture with the actual literal meaning here. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for prearranged signals and for scheduled appointments for days and for years. And so in creation, God built into creation prearranged signals for you and I to be able to follow and to look at to prepare us so that we would know when it was time for his scheduled appointments. And so what you're going to see is as we begin to consider the calendar, um, all of these feasts were built around these prearranged signals in the heavens because that's what their calendar was based upon. So the spring feast, when we refer to those, we're talking about Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks. And then the fall feasts would be trumpets, Day of Atonement, and Tabernacles. And so we're not going to spend a lot of time really getting into any of the details of these. That's what we're going to do in the, in the following studies. Um, but these are the seven feasts that God is referring to in Leviticus 23 when he says, these are appointments. I am preparing you. These are dress rehearsals for coming appointments where I'm going to intervene and, uh, and bring to pass my will in the midst of mankind. Three of these feasts actually required a pilgrimage. And so three of these feasts, what would happen is it didn't really matter where you lived. You were required by God to travel to Jerusalem to celebrate this feast. Deuteronomy 16.16. 16. So I'm going to go ahead and read that one. Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose. In the feast of unleavened bread and in the feast of weeks and in the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. So you see the feast here, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, which is Pentecost. So you think about that, the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, all of the Jews had to gather there in Jerusalem. This is why it was so crowded there when the day of Pentecost happened, and they spilled out onto the streets speaking in tongues, and suddenly 3,000 people get saved because people are everywhere. Jerusalem is filled up with people from all over the place. This is why people from all these different people groups and languages and cultures got saved that day. They were all there for the Feast of Weeks because God told them they had to be. So God brought all these people in for this divinely scheduled appointment. So the Feast of Weeks, and then you have the Feast of Tabernacles, which is later in the fall. So these are the three feasts where all, uh, they're all required to go back to Jerusalem in order to celebrate this feast properly. So any questions so far? Anything we've covered? Any, any thoughts? Yeah. Pentecost. Yep. Yeah, the Feast of Weeks. What's that? That's this Sunday. Why is it called Pentecost? Good question. The first question was, uh, does Feast of Weeks have another name? The answer was Pentecost, for those you can't. Here on the microphones. Yeah, I'm a rookie at this uh, Zoom thing, so <laughs> I don't know to repeat questions like that. So yeah, you'll see, uh, sometimes you'll see Feast of Weeks, that refers to Pentecost. I think in one of our other scriptures, it talked about uh, the, the booths, but that's also the Feast of Tabernacles. So a lot of them have a few different names that they go by. So yep. back to Chris's question, why, why is it Pentecost? Anybody know? Danny. Very close. Wrong feast. 
after the feast of first fruits. Yes, so you counted 50 days after the feast of first fruits, and that was how you arrived at when the day of Pentecost would be. So that's why where you get Pentecost from. It's 50 days. Yeah, penta meaning five. So, yeah, the Pentagon. Pastor's throwing me all kinds of comments. So, so the calendar here. Um, so to understand the Feast of the Lord, you know, if you're going to have an appointment with somebody, you have to be on the same calendar. One thing that I've often thought about is we have varying time zones throughout the U.S., and I've never lived close to a time zone line, but you think about what if you did? What if you live right on the border of Georgia and Alabama? Say you live in Georgia, then you work in Alabama. Well, you have to, you have to function by two different clocks because there's an hour difference there. You work at Alabama time zone or the central time zone, and then you live in the eastern time zone, and church is eastern time zone. I mean, it's, it would be crazy to try to figure that out. And so in order to make your appointments on time and not miss it, you have to be functioning on the same calendar, the same time. And so this is true when it comes to these feasts as well, is we need to be functioning on the same calendar. So we need, to, not that we need to function on, we need to understand the biblical calendar. You know, there, there's a lot of movement out there for the Jewish roots movement where, where people begin to study this kind of thing and they try to take Christianity back to its Jewish roots and, and, and turn it back into a form of Judaism. And that, that's, that's not the goal here. That's not what God, uh, God is looking for us to do. What he's looking for us to do is understand these events in history, understand these scheduled appointments so that we can develop a greater trust and confidence in the sovereignty of God. Yeah, several of the New Testament writers address that issue where people get hung up on uh, the festivals and things like that. Colossians 2, 16 and 17, it says, Festivals, new moons, Sabbath days, they're a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So we can get caught up on, on things like that, but we always have to remember that Christ is the emphasis. Yep. And so that's the purpose for this study is we want to understand this because it really brings out, again, the sovereignty of God and, and God's involvement in mankind. And really, what you're going to see as we go through this study, the entire plan of God's redemption of mankind is built into these feasts. It's all there. And so it's important to know and understand this. And in order to do that, we need to understand the calendar that it was, uh, that it was built around. So the, biblic, the Jewish calendar is different than the calendar in use by uh, the rest of the world. So you and I go by what the Gregorian calendar. I don't know if it goes by other names. I didn't, I didn't really do a whole lot of time researching all the different ideas behind the calendar. But we function on what is called a Gregorian calendar. And Chris may have some ideas, some rabbit holes here with calendars and things. But, um, we can but, go off on some tangents if you would like. But the Western world generally functions by the Gregorian calendar, which is a solar calendar based on rotation of the earth around the sun. And Chris would probably have a tangent to say that, no, 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 the sun actually revolves around the earth, and I can prove it. But <laughs> flat earth and all that. <laughs> so how long does it take for the earth to revolve around the sun? 365. Now, this is tough, I know, but. 365.25, and it, it, the decimal goes on, but basically 365 and a quarter days for the earth to go completely around the sun. This is how we constitute a year. Why do we have leap years? We just had one this year. Why do we have those? To make Nobody up for knows. all those point two fives that yeah. we miss every year. Exactly. So that 0.25 has to go somewhere, right? And after four years, it builds up to one. So we add a day every four years, right? February 29th. So we have a leap year. When does a new calendar day begin for us? Midnight. Midnight. Yeah, so that's when the calendar changes. Now, the reason I bring these things up is because in the Jewish calendar, these are all a little bit different. So... The Jewish calendar is a solar as well as a lunar calendar. The years are calculated by revolutions around the sun, while months are determined by the phases of the moon. So how long does it take the earth to revolve around the sun? We've already talked about that, 365 days. How long is a lunar cycle? Anybody know that? How long does it take for the moon to go all the way through the full cycle and, and start over with a new moon? Bill? Almost 30 days. Almost 30. Yeah, a little over 29 days. So 
what happens then is if you base your months on, a, on the lunar revolution, or basically from new moon to new moon, then you're going to end up with months that are 29 to 30 days. Since it's just a little over 29, some of the days, some of the months in the Jewish calendar are 30 days, some of them are 29 days. And so it goes back and forth. But once you add all of that up, then what you end up with is a problem because then your year is only 354 days or so, somewhere around there, give or take. But it takes 365.25 to go all the way around the sun, so that doesn't, that doesn't work, does it? So what they do in the Jewish calendar is they don't have a leap year, they have a leap month, or yeah, an entire leap month. And they do that every three years. They add on an entire month at the end of the year in order to make up for that. So it's all very confusing right now. I guess this is why Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour. <laughs> yes. Because it's really hard to figure out. <laughs> and, and when I was studying this, you know, so they count the, uh, the, the years by the re revolution around the sun. And so according to the Jewish calendar, I think it's the year 5780 or something like that. But when I was researching this, they said, but... Many of the historians and rabbis say that there's a lot of lost years in there, like 165 at minimum lost years. I mean, I, I lose keys, I lose my phone, but I don't know how you lose 165 years and more. Keto. <laughs> but somehow these years have disappeared. Um, so we don't really know exactly what year it is by the Jewish calendar. They have, a, you know, a relatively close estimation, um, but, you know, they don't know for sure. So no man knows the day or the hour. The Jewish calendar rectifies this problem by having the leap month every third year. And so this ensures that the feasts are always in the spring and summer. Now, any idea why would that be important? Why does it matter? Because, you know, if you only have 354-day years, your, all your holidays, everything starts to move and really rotates around the year unless you do something to fix that. So why do they need to fix that? Deuteronomy 16.1, somebody can read that one. Observe the month of Abib, and keep the Passover unto the Lord thy God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord thy God brought thee forth out of Egypt by night. So this scripture says, observe, or the word means guard, the month of Abib, which is also the month called Nisan. And this is part of the problem that makes it confusing. They have so many different names for all this stuff. I mean, why do you have so many names for a month? But it's the month of Nisan, and keep the Passover unto the Lord thy God, for in the month of Abib, or Nisan, the Lord thy God brought thee forth out of Egypt. So God is saying, make sure that the feast of Passover stays in the month of Nisan, it need, because it, it's on a set day. And what they needed to do is make sure that this stayed in the spring and summer. Now think about the Jewish culture. This was an agricultural culture. Everything was based around agriculture when the crops would ripen, when they needed to be harvested, when they needed to be planted. So all of life revolved around that. And that's also true of these feasts. These feasts are very, very agricultural just in, the, in, in basis. And so in order for these feasts to work right, you know, the Feast of First Fruits has to do with reaping of the barley harvest. Well, if the timing is not right, it's not time for the barley harvest. So you can't do the Feast of First Fruits if the barley's not ripened and ready to harvest. So they had to make sure that these feasts stayed at about the same time of year, so they had to do these leap months just to make sure that everything stayed at the right time. So on the screen there now, you, you can see uh, kind of a breakdown of the Jewish calendar on the outside there. Month number one being the month of Nisan, and maybe we could have our rabbi. I don't know if he wants to take time to pronounce all these months, but uh, is it worth it or? I can't even see it. <laughs> oh, jeez. Rabbi. Turn yeah. around, it's on the screen. You I can thought read the rabbi had all this memorized. You don't need to read it. That says April. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I can get everybody these slides if you want to have access to this so that you can have it for comparison. Um, I can send these out to everybody. Um, but basically, it just kind of shows the feasts in the spring that we're going to be talking about to begin with. So these are the feasts, uh, the spring feasts, which is Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, and Pentecost. Those fall in the months generally of April uh, and then May, May to June time frame. So 
they always fall in those months, and then you've got the fall feast, which generally falls September, October time frame on our calendar. Um, they're always on the same set days in the, in the Jewish calendar, but they're different days for us because, you know, we have very different calendars. So, um, when does a day begin for us? Midnight. Midnight. When does a day begin in the Jewish calendar? Not midnight. Sunset. Sunset. And it's really, it's interesting, it's very specific. So it's at sunset, but the way that is verified and confirmed is three stars have to be visible in the sky. Once three stars are visible in the sky, that's considered the beginning of a new day. And there have to be two witnesses to confirm that. It's kind of an interesting, I don't know, maybe conspiracy, someone wants to start the day early. No, 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 I don't, I don't see the three. Well, in reality, what, what this shows is, I mean, it seems like, okay, you're really splitting hairs about all this and all these dates, and when does the day begin, add this month. Well, the, you got to understand the Jewish culture and mindset. They really believed that the Bible is the Word of God, infallible, and they took it as commands uh, to basically say, when God says this feast will begin on this day at sundown, well, that's why they were so precise in having three people to determine. Yep, it's sundown. Yes, it's the new moon. So they would be precise in celebrating these feasts at the exact time God commanded. They took the word of God so seriously that they had rabbis assigned to watch the moon and say, it's the new moon, it's Sabbath, and things like that. And so it seems like, man, why all this split in hairs? Because they believe God's command and wanted to follow it exactly. This is why we have the rabbi here. We, we need this level of insight. I don't, I don't see why this, but the rabbi knows. So thank you for that. Uh, this could be a rabbit hole. Um, the biblical <laughs> prophetic calendar is even a little bit different. So when we talked about Daniel and the 70 weeks and uh, the calculations of the years in the Bible, all of that is, I think, as far as I know, pretty much all of that is calculated based on a 360-day year. But... You know, the Jewish calendar now adds up to less than that, 354. The solar calendar is 365. It's, so it, it can get very confusing. Yeah, and so as covered, I was researching we, this, go ahead. We covered a lot of that in the, uh, uh, the last, the rapture study when Jeremiah was talking about Daniel's prophecy of 70 weeks. And you could calculate exactly from uh, Daniel's prophecies when uh, Jesus was coming into the, the temple and, and uh, uh, that was, they were throwing the, the palm branches down. But you have to remember 360-day calendar. If you calculate it 365-day year, uh, then you're going to be off. And so there's people that you can get the commentaries and look at it. They, they realize something's off but when they go by that Jewish 360 days. Everything lines up. And all those prophecies that were in Daniel fell on the exact day. And you know what is interesting? As I was researching this, there's a lot of historical documents that prior to the 8th century that numerous historians calculated everything based on a 360-day year. So that there, there was a time when everybody was calculating a year based on 360 days. However, that changed around the 8th century. And that's when you begin to have varying calculations of what constitutes a year from the 8th century on. So why would that be? There's a hint on the slide here that Hezekiah was king at the time of this shift. Hmm. Is there something that happened at the time of Hezekiah that may have... Al? Sundown. Exactly. So, and I'm not saying this is doctrine. You know, we're not... He said listening. sundial. Yeah. It's that <laughs> Zoom rookie again. <laughs> Sorry, Al said sundial. The sundial went back. And so, but what, what is believed to have happened is that basically everything got thrown off. In order to make that happen, God shifted everything. In order to make the sundial go back, that the, all of those cycles were thrown off just a little bit. And when you play that out over time, everything began, everything shifted a little bit. And so from that point on, it's when you have different reckonings, mostly 365 days to make it all the way around the sun instead of 360. Just an interesting tidbit that, uh, that I came across. But A Hebrew rabbit hole. Hebrew rabbit hole, yeah. <laughs> 
So let's talk about a new beginning. In Exodus chapter 12, God did something profound to the calendar of the Jewish people. He started it over. So Exodus 12, 1 and 2. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Now, Nisan, which is the month here, uh, was not the beginning of the year. So this would be like, say we're in the month of April, and all of a sudden there was a declaration that said, you know what, April is the new new year. From now on, the new year starts in April. That's what happened here. God said, you know what, this is going to be the beginning of the year now. This is going to be a, a new way of reckoning the years. This is a new beginning uh, this shall be to you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So God completely changed the calendar in Exodus chapter 12. And ever since that time, the Jewish people have had two calendars. They have the civil calendar, which would, would uh, calculate the beginning of the year on what's called Rosh Hashanah, which is somewhere in the fall, somewhere September time frame. They base that on, what, this is when they think Adam and Eve were created. They say that's the beginning of the year, and then that was how they were calculating the beginning of a new year was Rosh Hashanah, sometime around September. But from this point on in Exodus 12, God says, nope, I'm changing that. The new year is going to start in Nisan. In the month of Nisan, that's the new year. And so since that time, they've maintained both calendars. The religious calendar, based on Exodus 12, says that, you know what, this is the new year. And the reason God did that is he was lining up his scheduled appointments for these seven feasts. So the seven major feasts of the Lord, again, are divided into two different uh, cal uh, not cal categories, let's say. Uh, the spring feasts and the fall feasts. So the spring feasts, the, the interesting thing about them that we're going to bring out in this study is the spring feasts teach about the first coming of the Messiah. So again, we're talking about scheduled appointments. We're talking about dress rehearsals. That's what these feasts are for. And what they're pointing toward is the coming Messiah. The Jews understood this very clearly. And so they understood this, this feast and all that we're doing is pointing toward an expectation of the coming Messiah. And then the fall feasts teach about the second coming of the Messiah. And so what we're going to see as we go through these studies is the spring feasts, of course, they've already been fulfilled. The fall feasts, however, have not because they speak about the second coming of Jesus Christ, and so we're looking forward to those. Chris. So just a quick review about the months and the years. You're saying they count 365 days, and then it's considered one year, but they don't begin, and they, be, they begin and end their months based on the moon cycle. Yes. Okay. Just wanted to clarify that for everybody. Yep. The moon cycle dictates when the months begin and the end, but they count the years by the 365-day rotation around the sun. Exactly. Okay. Yep. And so every third year, the, the last month of the year in the Jewish calendar is Adar, is the name of the month. And so they have Adar the second. <laughs> Adar two is what they call it, the original name. But uh, they, they just add a month at the end to kind of balance that out. Because if, if you look at our calendar, if you were to look at the moon cycle, you would see that that moon cycle crosses over into months and It'll begin in the middle of the month. It'll end in the middle of the month. But according yep. to the religious calendar, the Jewish religious calendar, the month begins at the new moon, and it ends when the moon is gone. Yep. Okay. Exactly right. All right. So understanding the feast. So the spring feast, these are the ones that we're going to cover first. So the first feast we're going to talk about is the feast of Passover. Does anybody know what that is related to? What is the Passover? Related to in typology, or what do you... Where did it come from, or origin. originate? Origin. Danny? When God led the Israelites out of Egypt. Chris? The angel of death passed over those who had the blood on the doorpost and did not kill the firstborn. Exactly. So there was a lamb that had to be selected, that had to be slain. The blood had to be spread on the doorpost. Uh, and when the death angel came, and this was, this was the final straw that brought the children of Israel out of slavery and bondage in Egypt, was the, the, uh, the death angel was going to kill the firstborn in every house throughout the land, unless they had the blood. 
Then the death angel would pass over the house. That's where the, the name comes from. Um, but this was the very first feast. And then the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Does anybody know when that one starts? The very next day. So the Feast of Passover is on the 14th day of the month of Nisan. The 15th day of the month of Nisan is when unleavened bread begins, and that is a seven-day feast. And why would they have unleavened bread? Does anybody know? And I'm just trying to see, see if anybody has any, uh, any, any background in any of this right now. So the unleavened bread, what would be the reason? So the, think about the children of Israel. They're in Egypt. God says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to deliver you. You need to be ready to go. Al? Al? He said that uh, leaven is a picture of sin and they want to clear the house of all of that uh, before they celebrate Passover. And so that's the spiritual aspect of it. And so what you'll see as we study these feasts is there is spiritual truth that is revealed by what they're doing. Uh, there's things, typology, there's things that, you know, something that they're doing in the feast that represents something else. And that Al brought up a good example of that. Leaven represents sin all through the Bible. And so God is saying... Remove the leaven. The leaven has to be cleaned out of the house. And for seven days, they were to not eat any leavened bread. So they had to eat unleavened bread. Bill? So, yeah, just to keep going with your question to try to ask, you know, about unleavened bread, where that come from. Think about the first Passover. They ate that lamb in their house. Then what was the next thing they did? Split the town. Get they, out of there. They left town. And so uh, anyone remember God's command about the bread to take with them? When you put yeast in bread what does it do Rises. you have to let it sit right you let your bread sit on the counter i'm um, not a watch my wife cook uh, and it's got to rise but god said you know what you kill this lamb you eat it and then you got to flee you don't have time for your bread to rise so you're going to make just flat cakes with they no even had yeast to eat it. with their shoes on literally he yeah. told them eat they, with your shoes on they were ready to beat feet and get out of Israel before Pharaoh changed his mind. So the practical reality was, like Sorry, Bill said, they had to be Sorry. ready to go. They didn't have time to wait on bread to rise so they could have some nice loaves. They just had to have this unleavened bread, these, you know, these uh, wafer cracker things. Um, and that was all they could have because they had to be ready to go and be on the move. Has anyone were, heard of matzah? We've heard of matzah. Mozzarella. <laughs> <laughs> Not mozzarella, but matzah. Those are those crackers. You see them. They, they'll have them in the one section at Walmart or Kroger. But uh, that's the festival. Hamatzah is unleavened bread. That's what that cracker is. It's uh, basically bread with no leaven in it. And then you have first fruits would be the, the next one. And so uh, the fulfillment of that speaks about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so this, so unleavened bread is actually a seven day feast. You know, nowadays the Jews basically kind of refer to this entire eight day period, which you have Passover. Unleavened bread starts a seven day period. So it's an eight day period of feast. They generally just refer to it as Passover most of the time nowadays. Um, but right in the middle of that, you also have the feast of first fruits. So right here in this eight day period, you have three feasts back to back to back. Well, you think about Jesus, he was crucified, he was. Uh, buried, and he rose from the dead back to back to back. And so you see the fulfillment of these three feasts. That's the reason they're back to back, is that it was exactly how it was going to happen with the Messiah when he came, when he fulfilled it. And then you have the last one is the Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost, which again was how many days later? Fifty. Fifty days later. And so this one, uh, there's some very specific things that they're supposed to do. This one celebrates a different harvest. So the First fruits is the barley harvest. The Feast of Pentecost is the wheat harvest. And I'm not a farmer, so I just know that because I read it. I don't know anything about when these things really, you know, the, the timing of this stuff. But, but that's when the harvest is uh, for wheat harvest. And there's some things that they do that represent the church. There's two loaves that have to be waved. So at this feast, they actually eat leavened bread rather than unleavened bread. And there's two loaves that they wave as part of the offering that represents Gentile and Jew that are part of the church. And so we're going to get into a lot of those details when we, we talk about each of these feasts. Uh, but I'm just kind of, again, laying the groundwork here for where we're going with this. So these first three feasts all occur in the month of Nisan, Nisan Maxima. 
And then Pentecost is in the month of Sivan. Not seven, but Sivan. I think. Is that how you say that, Rabbi? Sure. Okay. <laughs> and then we have the fall feast, so the Feast of Trumpets. Can anybody think of what the Feast of Trumpets might have to do with? We just spent 15 weeks on it. <laughs> Blowing trumpets. <laughs> and what, what, when do trumpets happen? One in particular. Al again. Okay, time for harvest. Yeah, that's true. But it's, yes. Exactly. The rapture, Thank you. Yeah. The rapture. First Thessalonians 4.16, the Lord himself shall descend with a shout, with the voice of God, the trump of the archangel, then Christ shall rise first. Come on, folks. We just spent 15 weeks on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have the Day of Atonement, and then you have the Feast of Tabernacles. And so these fall feasts... And Tabernacles is Chris's favorite, relates to... The millennial reign. <laughs> feast of booths. <laughs> <laughs> so these feasts are the ones that are not yet fulfilled. So we are still looking forward to the fulfillment of these feasts. Um, and that's an exciting thing. Um, so thank God for that. I'm getting the chills already. Yeah. So that is the end of the introduction here. Are there any, uh, any questions that anybody has? There should be a lot. These. Go ahead. Patrick got a question. Go ahead, Patrick. Patrick? Patrick? No, no, I, I, was, I was trying to answer the question, but Hal beat me to the plank. Oh, okay. Hal's quick. Yeah, yeah he's very quick on his feet. I saw him at Home Depot today, and I, I was amazed how quick he was. <laughs> <laughs> was there another one? Yes. Uh, JT, go ahead. Uh... Don't ask wondering... any hard questions. Okay. <laughs> In regards to the communion, speaking about the bread and the leaven, and the leaven representing sin, is this is why we eat a cracker, not just only to represent his blood, but his, I mean his flesh, I'm sorry, but his flesh also not being of sin, of course, because he's Jesus with the non-living bread. Yeah, exactly. The, we'll find out when we start to study uh, the, the, the Feast of Passover, uh, the cups that they drink at a Passover meal, uh, the bread that they eat at the Passover meal, the unleavened bread, that really communion that we take uh, comes out of that celebration of the Exodus. And so, yeah, exactly. They're commanded to eat unleavened bread, picture of no sin, uh, here you have the sacrifices to the Lord uh, representing Christ. There's no sin. There's no leaven in those things. So, yeah, it's exactly correct. So what we do need to realize is that when we say an Easter and we're celebrating Easter as Christians, we're actually celebrating uh, the Passover. And the Passover was around long before all these other uh, religious non-Christian holidays were around. So there might be non-Christian holidays that coincide, but... God ordained these feasts a long time before any of these other religious, other non-Christian, non-Jewish beliefs came around. And so when we're doing Passover, we're, we're doing Easter, we're doing communion, we're, not, we're celebrating actually what God commanded to celebrate. He said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And we always do it around the springtime, right around the time that they also celebrate the Passover because we're doing it in remembrance of what he did and looking forward to his future second coming. Yeah. So this wasn't something that was made up by Christianity to kind of mimic, to have something, because you hear a lot of different uh, people out there that try to say, well, Easter is really a pagan holiday. No, we're not celebrating Easter. We're celebrating what Jesus Christ did on the cross, what he died, and he rose again for our sins. And that was ordained a long time ago, even before Israel was a nation, because they were still coming out of Egypt. God commanded, him, commanded them to have these feasts, and we're still celebrating what he did on those days, even today. So just so that you can keep that in mind, this was done a long time ago, and we're still celebrating that in commemoration of what Jesus Christ did, how he fulfilled this, and how he's coming to fulfill other uh, prophetic events as well. And to go back to uh, the question about the, the Last Supper in particular. So think about this. They're celebrating Passover, and... 
going into unleavened bread, which means all leaven has to be removed, right? So they, they, they go to great pains to remove every bit of leaven from the house, from their lives, in order to make sure that they are fulfilling this feast the way God has ordained. They're not allowed to have one shred of leaven in their home. And so they, they, they're incredibly thorough in doing this. Well, is it possible to have fermented wine and not have leaven? No, it's not possible. So there's no way that you could have fermented alcoholic wine as part of the Feast of Passover and Unleavened Bread because God forbade it. They couldn't have anything leavened. So I'm sorry that wasn't, you know, get drunk wine. That was grape juice, unfermented, because they were not allowed to have leaven. It's kind of hard to run from Egypt through the desert when you drink some alcohol, too. Yeah. Well, Very even true. if it was alcoholic wine, there was 13 guys sharing one cup, so nobody got <laughs> drunk. <laughs> Danny. So his question was, what if people didn't follow these rules that God set forth concerning the holidays? Were there any consequences? Uh, they would be ostracized, essentially. Yeah, so there, there was certain requirements. They had to be clean in order to celebrate these, and so there was provision made if, you know, somebody touched a dead body and was not, able to, was not clean and could not celebrate Passover. They, there was provision made for them to do it a month later. So that, there was ways that they could, uh, could still celebrate and be obedient to these feasts, but yes, if they weren't keeping the feast the way God said, then the warning was always there that they would be cut off from the people of God. So yes. Fortunately, they didn't heed, though. Chris, were you going to say something? I was just going to add, and it's even when you're reading the Old Testament and it goes through all this uh, long lineage, this list of people who gave, they begat so-and-so and they begat so-and-so, and you were talking about how they kept it so detailed. The, the, when does the new day begin? And it was very detailed about uh, the things that they had to do because these were essentially prophetic events as they came to realize and as we realize now you know there's a reason why they took great care to keep track of such detail because God told them you know the Messiah will come through your descendants I will establish my kingdom on earth through your descendants and we looked at some of that through um, throughout the rapture study how they were given certain promises and so in order to keep track, say, well, God told us he's going to do this, so we need to keep track of it. So they're keeping these details. So then when these things actually happen, they say, yep, this is real. This is true. This is what God said he was going to do. And so the, it's important for us also to, to know the details and to keep track of it because we're told to look for his second coming. So we look how detailed and, and factually detailed it was all these events were fulfilled in the past in order for us to stay alert and be ready as he commanded, you know, to, to be watchful and be ready because your enemy, like a roaring lion, the devil seeks to devour you. He's out there trying to deceive us. He's out there trying to mislead us. And so the better we know what God's word says, the better we can um, see clearly and the better we can stay on the track that God has for us. So it's important for us to not only to know this and understand it, um, but to actually pay attention and, and be aware of the things that are taking place um, as these events take place. Hallelujah. Any other questions? Yes. Still apply in what sense? What do you mean? No. No, I, Bill brought up the scripture. Yeah, she was asking if uh, some of the feasts that Sorry, haven't been fulfilled yet, if we are supposed to be uh, honoring or keeping those feasts. Well, it's actually, some of them is not possible because the temple does not exist. And for two, almost 2,000 years, Israel didn't even exist as a nation. Now, if they were commanded to appear before the Lord on the Feast of Booths or Feast of Tabernacles, it wasn't possible. There was no temple. And there was no way they had there. As you'll begin to see, and as we start to look in the detail of these studies, the different dress rehearsals, the different uh, things that they were called to do, 
a lot of it re, uh, revolved around the temple and, and worship. So it literally wasn't possible. Part of the reason is because Jesus Christ was that fulfillment. Yeah, That's a lot why. of these had to do with the, the cleansing uh, from sin. And so we know, you know basically with the, the, the death and resurrection of Christ, that perfect sacrifice has finally been made. You can read in Hebrews chapter 10 how the priest stood every year to make an atonement for the people, but that was done once and for all by Christ on the cross. So basically, uh, these festivals were no longer needed. They found their fulfillment in Christ. And as Chris mentioned, uh, you know, this is why the Jews are, are so much wanting to rebuild their temple, because basically they're not getting that atonement, how they see it from the Old Testament, because the temple sacrifices aren't there. Uh, so basically, yeah, the answer to your question, no, there's no need for uh, Christians to uh, fulfill these feasts as they come along. I mean, we do celebrate Easter. We celebrate basically a Sabbath or, you know, the church services on Sunday. Um, but again, that scripture I read earlier, festivals, new moons, Sabbath days, they're a shadow of what's to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So no, we're not uh, required. There is a, a movement, the Hebrew Roots movement, other churches that have really gotten into the Hebrew Roots. It, it's essential to understand those things to get to fully understand the Word of God, but they kind of get caught up and frankly a little bit weird when they start doing all the keeping the, the Hebrew festivals, feasts, rituals, things like that. You start to make a substitute to say, oh, well, the, the death and resurrection of Christ on the cross and celebrate these feasts to be saved. And so you can start to emphasize it too much and, and frankly, get a little bit weird. And what we, the one thing I like is this is called the feast of the Lord, not the feast of the Jews. No, this is the feast of the Lord. This is what God commanded. And he's the one that's fulfilling these things and he's the one that's bringing them to pass. Um, and it's kind of like I was saying during the the rapture one, the more you begin to study, the more you see the scripture just begins to weave together seamlessly. The deeper you go into Genesis, you see that it all points to Jesus Christ. You go into Exodus and you see here in Exodus, it points to Jesus Christ. Then you go to John where he's actually baptizing Jesus, who was the Messiah, and how he's saying, behold the Lamb of God. And just like we have phrases, you know, if I tell somebody, I told one of my coworkers, I was like, man, don't be a Grinch because he wasn't going to buy his wife a uh, Christmas present. Um, he hadn't bought one for her in years. I was like, man, don't be a Grinch. Like a couple of days later, he's like, man, how do you get to this one jewelry store? You know, we understand a reference, don't be a Grinch, because it's part of our culture. It's part of Christmas. You know, when he said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, because these things were part of their culture and part of their everyday existence, they understood it. So the more we read it, the more we'll be able to take out of the Bible, and the more we'll be able to get out of the preaching you'll begin to hear these references and be able to, to, uh, to draw more out of it. So it, you'll see how all these scriptures begin to weave together and paint a picture of Jesus Christ and uh, who and what he's come to do. It, you can see this in the New Testament when Jesus appears before Pilate. Pilate questions, they say you're a king of the Jews. Are you the king of the Jews? He was kind of clueless. I, I don't understand this. But the Jews knew exactly what Jesus was saying. They knew exactly who he was claiming to be, the Messiah, and that's why they wanted to kill him instantly. So you could see how having this knowledge of the Old Testament uh, really helps you see you know, the, the fulfillment in the New Testament. So it is important to study, but you don't want to you know, uh, join the Hebrew Roots Church or something like that. <laughs> but the main thing for your, uh, as we wrap it up, uh, this whole study, uh, basically there's one chapter where all seven feasts are listed. It's Leviticus 23. So write that down. That's your homework this week. Go through Levit Leviticus 23. You'll see all seven of the feasts there. Uh, if you've got time, get a commentary out. Look up the different uh, uh, feasts that are there. And then next week in specific, we're going to start with Passover. So that's Exodus chapter 12. Read that. So for next Friday, Leviticus 23, that'll give you the basis of the whole lesson. And then Exodus 12 will uh, get your mind going for uh, specifically what we'll look at in detail in the next lesson. Praise the Lord. All right, well, let's uh, bow our heads. Every head bowed, every eye closed. You know, what, what makes this so powerful is it demonstrates the sovereignty of God and the lengths that God is willing to go to, the intricacy that, that he weaves into his creation, all for one purpose, and that is to redeem mankind. That's what all of this is about. It is about redeeming mankind who is lost because of sin. 
That is the danger that all of us face because we're all infected by this uh, eternal disease of death called sin, and there is no way out. There is no hope. There is no vaccine. There is no cure except for the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's what this, these feasts are all about. That's what the Word of God is all about. It is to point a lost, sinful man to the risen Savior that fulfilled every prophecy, every scripture about him for the express purpose of saving us, of delivering us, forgiving us, and redeeming us from the penalty that we so richly deserve. And thank God for it. And so the invitation I want to extend tonight to everyone that is here in the building as well as everyone watching online uh, is if you don't know Jesus Christ, maybe you know about him, maybe you've heard some of this before, you know a little bit about the Bible, you were raised in church, and all of that is wonderful, but if you don't know Jesus Christ personally, that doesn't save you. You must be born again. You must have a personal relationship with that risen Savior in order to make heaven your home. And that is the offer that we're extending tonight to anyone willing to take it, is if you want to receive Jesus Christ, you want to surrender your life to him and know him personally, you can do that. If you would like to do that tonight, raise your hand here in the building with us or anyone online. If you want to raise your hand uh, wherever you're at, we would love to pray with you tonight to receive Jesus Christ. This is really what, this is what life is all about, leading people to Jesus Christ. Anyone at all tonight? Maybe you're backslidden. Maybe you knew God at one time. You were saved. You knew what it was to have your sins forgiven and walk with God. But something distracted you. Something pulled you away. Your heart was turned away from God, and now you're backslidden. You're no longer living for God. You're no longer obedient to Him, and you recognize that tonight, and you would like to change that. You want to surrender your life to Jesus again, rededicate your life to Christ, raise your hand. We'll pray with you tonight, here or online. Hallelujah. So I want to just say a prayer for anyone online that wants to make that decision to surrender to Jesus. Just repeat after me. Say, Dear Jesus, I confess that I am a sinner. And I believe that you died for my sin and rose from the dead. And right now, I repent of my sin and surrender my life to you. I invite you into my heart to be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. If you prayed that prayer with us online or here in the building, I, I want to encourage you. The best thing you can do is to begin to make decisions. View this as a starting line. This is not a finish line. You can't say, oh, I finally got saved. I made it. No, this is a start line. And you begin today making decisions every day to say, you know what? I'm going to honor Jesus Christ. I'm going to make him first in my life, and I'm going to do what he says. If you're online and you prayed that prayer, I want to encourage you to go to our website, AthensVictoryChapel.com. There is a contact button right there on the, at the top of the main page in the top left corner. Click that. There is some contact information we would love for you to fill out so that we can pray with you, talk with you about Jesus, and just help you to live for God. And I want to encourage you. Tell people about Jesus. Get people to come to these studies because this, what we're going to be looking at is powerful. And it really does glorify the living God and demonstrate his sovereignty and demonstrate the reality and the truth of God. And it will stir your faith and it will stir the hearts of those that hear it. So I encourage you, invite people to come. And uh, we'll believe God to touch them. Praise God. Why don't we stand to our feet and uh, let's worship God. And then uh, we'll dismiss here in just a second. Hallelujah, God, we love you.